Okay, a very warm welcome to the second session of the conference. Our apologies for being a few minutes late. We've just been encountering and uh, coping with one or two uh, technical challenges which seem to uh, plague these things as we go through. But however, it seems that we've uh, managed to overcome the, the main difficulties anyway. Um, Hopefully they won't uh, bother us too much for the rest of the session. So I'm going to try and uh, share one or two items um, from my own very uh, short slideshow. There's only a couple of slides to show anyway. Our lineup this afternoon, uh, no, sorry, it's not quite afternoon. This morning is, as you see there, um, the various speakers. I won't go through them because we'll introduce them uh, as we come to them. But the, the theme of this session is sporting heritage and memories. And what we're going to do over the next, um, uh, over an hour or so, is to try and reflect some of the work which we've been doing in the face of the extraordinary practical challenges we've all faced in the last 18 months in this particular area uh, of our operation. And one of the uh, most significant uh, achievements we managed to complete despite everything uh, was the publication of Sporting Heritage Memories uh, Handbook, uh, which was uh, something of an epic production which Michael White and I undertook. Michael is one of the characters in the bottom right hand image there. And what we tried to do is to cover all the bases and we took a four nations approach to, to the whole thing. Uh, we, tried to consult as widely as possible before we pulled everything together. And, and I think one of the, the really important things to, to say about this is that because it's a four nations approach, there are different legal systems applying to, to the way sporting heritage is dealt with uh, across the country. There's different ways of delivering social care provision. In fact, in Scotland at the moment, we're going through a huge transitionary period, which is going to affect the way we're delivering a lot of this work. There are different sporting organizational structures, different ter types and, and um, levels of professional help and also resources and funding, uh, which we all have to cope with in our different ways. And uh, one thing I would like to stress about this, and, and we're keen to get people's views in it, is um, that this is very much a work in progress. And it was a snapshot of what was going on at the time in the middle of the pandemic and everything else. Uh, so we're very keen to get feedback on um, the contents, what, what is there, what isn't there, and how we can develop it going forward. So as I say, um, the, we, we tried to cover a lot of bases and we had to come at it from that point of view because we had no starting point where we, we could give everybody an idea of what sporting heritage and work in the field of reminiscence and memories uh, involved. And we're going to try over the next uh, session uh, to show some of the different ways um, some of the various groups which are established and are becoming more established and becoming more involved in this area of work uh, are the things they're doing at the moment and some of the things they're planning to do in the future. And uh, this is the, the second page of the handbook and it, it illustrates perfectly one of our uh, main successes in my own sport of Shinti where we took um, the reminiscence work into care homes, which was an enormous challenge, as you can imagine, during the pandemic. And this character we we have in this particular image is, is a person who underwent a, a, a massive transformation in his, his uh, lifestyle when we started to work with him in his care home, because he went from an individual who sat in the corner of a room uh, and was completely uncommunicative and, and was... Um, rapidly deteriorating physically and mentally and once we introduced him to some reminiscence work and and triggered his memories of his playing days he became the star of the show in the, in the home uh, where he was staying in Lochaber and you can see there the the active level of participation was beyond the nurses and the care homes belief uh, the transformation which took place in this character so we we firmly believe in what we're doing we're totally committed to what we're doing and what what we want to do now is to develop this and to integrate it into the delivery uh, of social care and social services across the four nations and as i said there are particular challenges in different uh, areas there now what i want to do 
in, and I'll just stop sharing that there because uh, that's all I have to say about what we've been doing and Sports Heritage UK is doing. I should have said at the start that I'm the non-executive director um, of Sporting Heritage UK uh, from Scotland, I suppose, representing Scotland's interests on the board. And it's been fascinating to work with uh, Paul and, and uh, other people on the board about how how we are meeting some of these challenges. So what, what I'm going to do in the next session then is to introduce you to some of the people who are involved in some of the areas they've been working and what they're going to do is show us the different types of resources we can use when we're, when we're developing our reminiscence work. Now, we're going to start with something which is very personal to me because to anyone growing up in the highlands of Scotland and indeed beyond as we're going to hear, in the last century, and that make, that ages me considerably when I say that, in the last century, if you had any connection at all uh, with sport in the Highlands, the, the name and identity of what was called the McPherson Sporting Stores in Inverness was central to sporting life in a, in a whole lot of ways. So our first speaker today is a member of that distinguished McPherson family. She now carries the name of Sheila McPherson Noble. And she's going to tell us uh, more about um, the the um, the history of a remarkable sporting dynasty, which is shorthand for, for a, the explanation of what's coming, and how how her work and how our family uh, has contributed uh, through their legacy, uh, the very active legacy, and how it's contributed into the way we apply sporting heritage in a particular area of Scotland sporting. Uh, history. So I'm going to hand you over now to um, Sheila McPherson Noble, who will take us through the pre first presentation. Sheila. Thank you, Hugh, and good morning, everyone. My McPherson family's influence on Highland sports covers a period of over 100 years, beginning in 1887 with the establishment of a sports emporium in Inverness. Although all sports were catered for, it was Highland Sports that earned the business its global reputation, namely stalking and shooting, fishing, and of course, the game of shinty. The family originated in Newton Moor in the area of Bednach, which is an area covered by several villages in the Scottish Highlands. When my great grand uncle, Duncan McPherson, retired from the 79th Highland, uh, sorry, Cameron Highlanders, it was he who established the Sports Emporium in Inverness. Duncan's, Duncan's nephew, my grandfather, John McPherson, also born in Newton Moor, became a herd boy when he left school at the age of 14. Two years later, he had progressed to the job of shepherd. And on one occasion, he was instructed to take a flock of 66 sheep to the market which involved a two-day walk over the hills to Inverness. While he was there, he visited his uncle Duncan and was most impressed with the store, but even more impressed with the fact that he had gas lighting, something Duncan, it's uh, a John, had absolutely no knowledge about. Life in the town seemed much more appealing than life in the village. So when Duncan decided that he wanted to sell the business and, and return to Badenoch, John borrowed money, bought the store and became the proud owner of John McPherson Sporting Stores in Verness. He married in 1905 and had six children, two sons and four daughters. Because he had no qualifications at all himself, he decided to send Alan and Hamish, his two sons, to serve their apprenticeships as gunsmiths and fishing tackle makers, and they completed their training in London and Birmingham. So that roughly sets the scene. The first sport I want to talk about is shoot, stalking and shooting. And this is a traditional sport that is carried out all, on all Highland estates um, in the Highlands of Scotland. And the main game are red deer, red grouse and pheasants. In the late 1800s, John was aware that gatekeepers um, were very, and stalkers were very keen to improve conditions for the red grouse. The birds feed on young heather shoots, and if the heather's not kept under control, then the birds don't thrive. 
So in order to let the young heather shoots come through, the old heather has to be burned off. At the time, this is at the you know, late 1800s, the method of burning heather was to use a tarry rope, set it alight and trail it through the heather to set it on fire. Around 1901, John invented Macpherson's patent heather burner. It was an appliance made of fairly substantial quality by a tinsmith in Inverness and took the form of a cylindrical tank with protruding nozzle, nozzles. The wick was fueled by paraffin and the flame was adjustable. Special burning regulations, of course, had to be observed and the burning had to be complete by the start, before the start of the grouse nesting season. In addition, if the weather was too dry, the birds would die from lack of moisture. So John invented the Safety Grouse Dew Fountain. It was a simple cone-shaped device which captured the dew overnight and retained the moisture for the young birds. Being qualified gunsmiths, Alan and Hamish were able to cater for the shooting fraternity, measuring their customers so that the guns would fit. When ordering a new shotgun or a, or a rifle, initial measurements would be taken because the length of the battle would depend on the type of, grout, type of game that was going to be shot. Measurements were also taken for eye alignment, depending on the customer's dominant eye and whether he or she was right or left-handed. Final minor adjustments were made in the store, making use of the small firing range, which included a target so that the customer could focus and aim. The brothers would fill their own cartridges and in the basement of the store, there were sacks of lead shot and barrels of gunpowder. Their cartridges were well known as the Royal, which is the, no, the number of points, 12 points on a stack. So they were called the Royal after that. My grandfather employed a taxidermist called John McDonald, but known to most as John the Stuffer. He worked for the McPherson family for 58 years and had a re reputation for being a perfectionist. He was in fact supposed to be the best in the country. His temper was short. And the worst thing you could do to John was disturb him at his work, especially when a customer would come in and ask him to stuff their dearly departed pet dog or budgie. He was an authority at stuffing and mounting stag's heads. His workshop was at the top of the four storey building and had an open fire where he stretched the deer skins out to dry after uh, they had been treated. Nearby there would be stacks of antlers and skulls and John was an expert at inserting glass eyes into the skull sockets. In later years, more modern taxidermists would use plastic molded skulls, but of course they would all look the same. But John never succumbed to modern methods. All his stags were original. During the annual stock take, the stag's heads that were on display in the store would be dusted and have a mothball inserted into each ear. At the end of the shooting season, customers' guns would be taken in and repaired and stored and locked securely away until they were needed the following season. One of the customers, Her Majesty the Queen, always sent her guns to be repaired and stored at the end of her annual stay at Balmoral. In 1917, John started McPherson's annual clay pigeon shooting match. It became the largest one day shoot in Britain and was known as the Gamekeepers Reunion. Special railway fairs were arranged for those who were going to arrive by train. Clay pigeon shooting continues today and there are many clubs across the Highlands and it has the advantage of being able to shoot all year round rather than just in the season. It has also become an Olympic sport and youngsters are encouraged to take part, but they use lasers instead of live ammunition.
So moving on to fishing, in the 1920s and 30s, Loch Ness became known as one of the early spring fishing areas. And it was quite common to see between 20 and 25 boats fishing around the loch, which of course gave employment to gillies and lots of other helpers. And it was quite common to catch salmon weighing about 28 pounds, roughly 13 kilograms. The Inverness Firth held salmon on their way up the River Ness en route to Loch Ness, which had several rivers running into it. The salmon would return to the river where they were spawned to create the next generation. The most successful lure used was the common sprat, which was caught in quantities in the Inverness Firth. The sprats would range in length between three to five and a half inches, and they were pickled and sold in jars to the fishermen. Special trawling rods were made for Loch Ness in greenheart wood. Others would be much lighter with a, a cane butt, but with a greenheart top section. The rods were about 14 feet long, roughly four metres, and there would be one over the stern of the boat, one over the bow, and a third in the middle, which was always shorter than the other two. The lines would be let out at different lengths, so they were floating at different levels in the lock. The boat was propelled by oars, which was mostly the method used in those days, but occasionally you would have one with an outboard engine, which would be throttled down to a very low speed. One of the reasons my grandfather was so successful was that he listened to his customers. And during the year, the coronation year of 1937, one of his customers asked him if he could produce a coronation sprat to celebrate. He thought about it and decided it would be a good idea if he dyed the sprats red, white and blue. The question is, how do you dye a sprat red, white and blue? John the Stuffer, who was also a specialist in fish taxidermy, was a man who spoke his mind. When the subject of dying sprats was raised, his response to my grandfather was, you must be daft, it can't be done. He was eventually persuaded. One third of the fish, including the head, was dipped in a red dye and put in a setting lotion. One third of the fish, including the tail, was put in a blue dye and put in the setting lotion. And the middle part retained its silver color to indicate the white part. Despite John the Stuffer's protestations that he had far better things to do with his time than dye wee fish, the coronation sprat was born and proved to be remarkably successful, not only during the coronation year, but for several years afterwards. So quickly moving on to the game of shinty. Like his uncle Duncan, John was a shinty player. At the end of the 19th century, shinty sticks, or camons as they are called in Gaelic, were clumsy, badly balanced chunks of wood called chessies. John wanted to improve the type of camon used and invented the hickory shafted shinty stick which became known as the John McPherson Cammon. It was made from the finest hickory grown in California and imported into the large timber yards in Liverpool and Portsmouth where it was steam bent. It was then supplied in block form in the shape of a shinty stick. The blocks had to season for between eight to 10 months and the finishing was done in store. My grandfather would work all through the night to fashion the blocks into perfect camons. Camons were ordered by the dozen because there are 12 players in a team and 12 sticks had to be sorted out into different degrees of loft. The John McPherson Cammon became the standard and continued to be that until the start of World War II when the supply of hickory was curtailed. Shortly after the Kamen Act Association was formed in 1896, my grandfather agreed to present the captain of the winning team of the Kamen Act Cup 
with a silver mounted cannon suitably inscribed. And that annual gift continued until the outbreak of war in 1939. Two years previously, he decided to present a cup to the winners of the senior schools tournament. And that cup is still played for today. After the war and after my grandfather died, the two brothers, Alan and Hamish, decided that they would restart the annual gift of the silver mounted cannon. And that continued until they retired in 1976. Wishing to continue the family link with Shinti, my sister and I presented a cup for the winners of the primary school tournaments. And so the family link with Shinti continues today. So in conclusion, throughout the years, the interior of the store and the way in which business was conducted changed little. The headed note paper was never modernized. The only additions were to add and sums in white at the top and very many years, a lot of years later, the telephone number and the postcode. The cash register was huge and heavy. The annual stock take was a chore because nothing was automated and every single fishing fly had to be counted. Over the years, the store became known as Johnny the Sports. When Alan and Hamish decided to retire in 1976, there was proof that the McPherson family had a huge global impact on Highland sports. During a flight in South America, one passenger was overheard asking another, did you hear that Johnny the Sports in Inverness is for sale? The store was a living museum. When it closed, some of the Shinty items were donated to the Clan McPherson Museum in Newton Moor, where they are displayed in the sporting section alongside camons and um, curling medals from the 1800s and rugby and cricket caps from the 1900s, all with a McPherson connection. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Sheila. That was a, a fascinating um, whip through, uh, by my reckoning, around 134 years of family <laughs> history, all in uh, 20 minutes or thereabouts. And it, I'm sure, brought uh, a whole new meaning to the, the phrase tears to a glass eye. I, I have actually seen a box of these glass eyes, and it's quite a remarkable uh, piece of sporting memorabilia. And, and we're very fortunate that the McPherson family have, have between them uh, donated a lot of the the um, the stuff, if I can call it that, from the shop, from the store, from their family collections to the Highland Folk Museum in Newton Moor and to the Clan Macpherson uh, Museum. And the challenge for us then is how to use all that stuff in terms of uh, bringing people's memories locally, whether it be curling, shinty, fishing, you, you saw the range of sports, and, and it's a family history, which is a truly global reach. Um, McPherson involved himself in the with the making of uh, hockey sticks, for example. He, he got a lot of these techniques. So it's a fascinating history, uh, and we're very grateful to you, Sheila, for that. We have probably have some questions which we can um, add at the end. Uh, and I was very fortunate, actually, when we were pulling all this together, um, a gentleman called Sandy McPherson, um, got in touch with me when he heard that uh, Sheila was going to do this talk. And you heard her references to Newton Moore, the village in the Highlands. Now, one of the most famous sporting products from the village of Newton Moor uh, was not in fact in Chinti, but in, in the field of rugby. And his name was uh, GPS McPherson, a very famous uh, Scottish rugby player, one of our all time greats indeed, indeed. And he was born in Newton Moor in 1903 and a great deal of his club rugby before he became an internationalist was was played for Edinburgh Academicals at their famous ground in Rayburn Place. 
uh, which is where we're going for our next um, contribution. Now, Sandy McPherson wrote to me and, and uh, as follows. He said, my personal recollections of Rayburn Place are based on being a pupil at the academy and playing there on Saturday mornings. The pitches were always wet and muddy. The legend was that the adjacent Inverleith Pond, being at a slightly higher level, leaked into Rayburn Place. I recall de-stoning the pitches after the return from being ploughed up for vegetables during World War II. And the famous mound was removed then, which enabled an extra pitch to be squeezed in. So that's part of the history of Rayburn Place, which is a, a, a very new set of um, ambitions now and a very new vision. Uh, and we're going to hear about that and it, its place in, in rugby and, and the way that the, the challenges they faced in converting a sporting venue like that into a modern venue which applies uh, reminiscence and commercial aspects to its undertaking. So we're going to hear now from Alistair Graham who, who will take us through these developments. I'm the fundraising coordinator for the Rayburn Place Foundation. And this is the iconic photograph of the Scotland team in the first ever rugby international played at Rayburn Place in Edinburgh 150 years ago. It's a historic ground and dates from 1858 where it was first used for cricket. And I want to share with you the story of its redevelopment and our plans for its future. The foundation was set up as a registered charity under the Scottish Charity Regulator in 2014, and it was established to promote sport and to promote heritage. We're redeveloping the ground and we're building new facilities in order to open it up to wider use and protect both its use for sport and the unique heritage which is attached to it. I want to talk about the context for this change and some of the constraints that are around it. Firstly, we started off with the ground which had outdated facilities which were leading to declining use. Secondly, there's a background of deteriorating economics for the operating of grounds for team sports due to the withdrawal of, of, uh, of um, local authority funding in many areas, but also the, uh, the increasing costs of running them. And uh, you often go around to see sports clubs uh, and you find that you sold off part of their land and, uh, and developed it uh, and got a one-off benefit to pay off their debts, but uh, it's a one-way street. So that was very important to us. Uh, another issue for us was the likelihood that alternative uses would be unacceptable with the reputation impact on, the, uh, on all those associated with the ground. And lastly, a partial sale of the land wouldn't deliver the financial sustainability. It's all very well taking in a capital receipt, but you've got to be uh, able to meet your operating costs on the way along. So increased income was absolutely essential. So what were the challenges of development? Well, firstly, we're trying to redevelop a historic ground in a sensitive area and we're building new facilities. Secondly, a previous attempt to, to develop uh, a different area of the ground uh, had failed uh, due to the, uh, to the, um, the bankruptcy of the, um, of the uh, company we were trying to deal with. And there was much skepticism therefore around what we could do next. Thirdly, the location covers two conservation areas in Edinburgh, the new town conservation area, but also the park area in Inverleith. And so it's a very sensitive site from a planning perspective. And uh, thirdly, it was clear that because of the site, the, the planners would require a building which would probably be quite expensive. Putting up something that's a, a steel shed would, would not meet the requirements of the community. So we had to bear the costs of a long planning process and the strict conditions that came out of that and, of course, with a vocal minority of, it, of opposition who didn't want to see anything happen. But this is what the first phase looks like uh, as of about six months ago. Uh, behind uh, the stand there is a street frontage uh, in, in Rayburn Place in Edinburgh. And uh, behind the stand on the ground floor level, there are a series of retail units. And I'll come back to, to them uh, later on. 
So the planning approvals and the enabling works, which are works that the council requires you to do before you can start, were completed in 2017. Uh, the foundation signed a long lease on the ground from the former pupils club of the school uh, in 2018 and uh, we started to get ready for a program which would be a phased development. Construction started at the beginning of 2019 but only completed in August 2020. We had delays at the back of 2019 and then we had COVID and a shutdown of construction. Uh, so here's what we've got over 10 million pounds raised and spent, but we've got a building which everybody thinks is a fantastic, which it is, and, and uh, has uh, already made a huge difference to the utilization of the ground, both outside and inside. But the first phase is all about sustainability because we need income to maintain team sports and, uh, and make the whole project economic and sustainable in the long term. So the development includes retail space behind that building, which is in a prime location in Edinburgh, which means good rents. So the Advantage site is already fully let with quality tenants. The rental income provides the funding for sport and for the heritage objectives, and it's a very strong rental income with good tenants, and we were able to borrow some money against the covenant of, of, of those lease agreements. And lastly, of course, COVID delays to the building handover and our ineligibility for government loan schemes because of the stage the project we're at were a real uh, disappointment to us, but we got through it, which is the key thing. So who benefits from this? Well, the income from the commercial elements enables the foundation to expand the existing programs on the ground to support new ones and offer wider access to better facilities and therefore we can impact many more lives through sport. A real target for us is the, the BATS Youth Rugby Program, which has been running for well over a decade now in the, uh, in the schools, the state schools in North Edinburgh and uh, brings sport to kids who wouldn't get it and starts in the primary with ball handling and all sorts of things like that. So it, it does a huge amount of work in getting children to active things and in feeding up into rugby for girls and for boys and uh, we're even thinking about going into other sports. We're the host ground in Edinburgh for an outfit called Trust Rugby, uh, which was set up by Jamie Armstrong, who's, who lives in Edinburgh, and uh, it's mixed ability rugby, and they're called clans, the clubs, and they're located uh, increasingly around the world now, uh, where able-bodied people get together by people who have you know some restrictions in what they can do but massively enjoy playing sport uh, and uh, they come and train and play on the ground and they're back there it's really good to see and we have other sports users who come and want to use it we had australian rules football this summer which was a new one for us and we have local community use the primary school sports bike band competitions have been asking about use of the venue so those facilities can generate more income and help us to maintain the ground and the cost of more intensive use. And Rear and Place is now a venue for the Rugby Memories Group. Uh, and uh, we're hoping to expand that uh, as time goes on. And for the wider public, of course, we want to share the history of international rugby because this is the ground where it all began. So here's the Museum of International Rugby, and it wants to tell the story of the historic significance of Rayburn Place in international sport and how the game developed over 150 years. We have education and heritage objectives, uh, and we have a conceptual design done and an outline business plan completed, which looks pretty positive. The, the site is very ad advantaged. It's, it's within walking distance of Princess Street. It was one of the most popular tourist destinations in the UK and it has a big footfall and uh, with the park and, and other things nearby, cafes, restaurants, it looks good in terms of visitor numbers and the initial case is certainly very positive. And fundraising is, uh, has started in 2021 with the making of a documentary film about the first international. So, uh, we did manage to mark the 150th anniversary in, on the 27th of March this year, despite COVID, uh, but it was very limited in what we could do. However, we did have the Scotland coaches down at Rayburn Place with the Calcutta Cup and the Old Alliance Trophy, this being just the day after 
they won the Six Nations in Paris, and uh, BBC uh, compiled a great uh, set of, of film clips for us, and the uh, hyperlink is on here, and if you go in and stick it in your browser, you'll be able to watch it. The film itself, the Great Game documentary, wants to tell the story of the 1871 game and its global significance in team sports. It was probably the first international in any team sport, and the story around how it came about and what happened afterwards is a really interesting one. The film budget was £120,000, and we raised it in four months. The instigators were Richard Bath, who's a rugby journalist for The Telegraph and also the editor of Scottish Field magazine, and Magnus Wake, who is a film director who lives on the ground, which on the, on the street, which overlooks the pitch where the match was played. Uh, we got money from sponsors. We got money from individuals. And then for the last 20, and we got money from uh, the DPS McPherson Charitable Trust. Uh, Hugh Dan was talking about the McPherson family in his presentation. Uh, and, and also from the Gordon Brown Memorial Fund. And, we raised the last 20,000 uh, starting on the anniversary date, and we did that in about uh, five weeks uh, using social media. The crowdfunder page and the RPF website reached 290,000 users, and the estimated reach of all the posts made about the project was more than one and a half million. It was quite an experience for me and uh, a lot of effort from a, a small number of people, but very, very productive. And of course, people have heard much more about the film. I'm glad to say the filming is now complete, the editing is nearly complete too, and the premiere is, uh, is going to be uh, in November. And we'll market the film to broadcasters and streamers because the secondary objective of making it was to provide a, an income which we could then use to cover our fundraising costs for the next phase of the project, i.e. the museum. So Rayburn Place is the birthplace of international rugby and the museum is going to tell the story of that and its unique heritage. The design is based around high quality audiovisual displays uh, and interactive also covering the story of the first international and the development of the international game, stories of key players and events and, and a look at the world rug wide rugby family. What's happened with rugby? What's it like in Tonga? What's it like in Japan? Uh, it's a worldwide sport now. So uh, the museum will increase the attractiveness of Raymond Place as a sports venue and benefit the local community through its contribution to the local economy. But the most important thing is that we share and celebrate the heritage and there's some great stories around it. Okay, and now just to finish off, uh, I'd like to share with you the footage that was shot on the 27th of March 2021 at Rayburn Place on the 150th anniversary of the first rugby international between Scotland and England played on this pitch and uh, thank you very much for listening. It feels important to us as Scots that we were involved in the first ever international rugby game. I knew stories about it. I, I remember seeing a, a painting of it uh, when I was younger and how it was more than 15 aside and that Scotland won. It's great to be at Rayburn Place to, to commemorate 150 years ago today. Um, that first ever game of uh, rugby union, international rugby union took place behind us. It means a lot to me. Um, I remember really vividly coming down here with my dad watching Ackies against Miller's 1990 championship decider, I think it was. I played here in 1999 for a season and a bit, and now my, my son's using, uh, using bats as well as, um, as his step up to playing. It's amazing coming down here on a Sunday morning watching the minis, the, the amount of numbers that come out, the smiles on the faces, that they have a great time and it's brilliant we've got this facility here to be able to do that. It's really exciting and quite cool to play on where the first ever rugby national game was played. And it just kind of feels iconic, the fact that uh, First ever international, Scotland versus England, a really intense rivalry was playing on the pitch I played and I'm standing on right now. It gives me more than uh, the usual degree of pleasure to be, uh, as a <laughs> Scotsman, uh, at this conference, straying onto the hallowed uh, turf of cricket. It's not a sport that we as Scots <laughs> are normally that well known for, but it just so happens that this week, 
our national team has been doing very well in the last couple of days in the big international tournament in Oman, the men's T20 World Cup qualifying series. Now, we, we had a huge result against Bangladesh, and then we disposed yesterday of the mighty Papua New, New Guinea, uh, which I didn't think was much of a cricketing nation either, but there you go. We'll take any win we get in cricket. Um, we're now in the cusp of qualifying for the next stage of the tournament, a big match tomorrow, uh, or a big couple of matches which will decide that. So if, if our footballing performance is anything to go by, this is when it all starts to go wrong, <laughs> when we're on the cusp of qualification. So anyway, I'm delighted to introduce two colleagues I've worked with um, off and on before and, and very familiar with a lot of their fantastic work, and that they're going to... Tell us a bit more today about what they're doing, the various aspects of the work they're doing in Reminiscence, um, and it's uh, based entirely on the work they do with the Yorkshire Cricket Foundation. So I think it's um, Paul Goodman who's going to open the bowling, or is it the batting, and Chris will respond. <laughs> Paul, over to you. Thank you so much, Hugh, Dan, and congratulations, hearty congratulations to Scotland. It was a fantastic result. In Scottish terms, in my view, it was right up there with um, Berwick Rangers having beaten uh, uh, Berwick Rangers having beaten the Man City Glasgow Rangers back in 1967. So, uh, so fantastic results. Um, I'm so pleased uh, to be invited here to talk about the work of uh, the Yorkshire Cricket Foundation and particularly our reminiscence program. In a few moments, I'm going to be handing over to Chris, but just so you know a little bit about um, our background. Um, I'm the Heritage Manager at the Yorkshire Cricket Foundation. Um, I'm from a museum background. And um, I'm, like Hugh Dan, also uh, a director of uh, Sporting Heritage Network. So it's great that we're able to come along here and showcase what we're doing and also to link up a network with other colleagues who might be also looking at running or establishing their own programme who, or who are currently running a reminiscence program. So before I hand over to Chris, I'd like to give you all a little bit of a, a, a framework for how we moved or why we're doing these reminiscence programs. So given that my colleague Chris is managing the slideshow, are you happy to move on to the next slide, Chris? If it works. We've got the same problem. Oh, no. There you go. That's it. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. So really, I just want to talk about the why and how. Uh, obviously, I won't insult your intelligence by you all being able to read, but I just really would like to run or canter through through these things. This is the kind of context for the work that Chris um, was was will talk about in a moment. Obviously, our the Yorkshire Cricket Foundation's mission and themes are around four key areas, and that's education, participation health and well-being and heritage and history and those last couple of themes are really important and they've been the driving factor using cricket as the catalyst for our ambitions to deliver on each of those themes but also to establish the Yorkshire Cricket Foundation as a social prescriber so working with um, our colleagues in the health profession and with other museums and cultural organizations to reach out to a range of different communities Obviously, we want to raise awareness of cricket heritage and how important it is. I mean, many local cricket clubs, which is formed the bedrock of our of our plans, uh, represent the best forms on the most venerable forms of living history in many in many villages and towns and cities. Um, and so they're hugely important and relevant to the local communities. And obviously, the real reason for us doing this, talking about health and well-being earlier on, and also around history and heritage is that we want to challenge mental health and societal ills. So particularly, we want to address our activities around those living with dementia or suffering with social exclusion or isolation. So how do we achieve this? Well, we set our reminiscence sessions up um, really using funding from the then Heritage Lottery Fund, which then became um, the National Heritage Lottery Fund. And we managed to get money from those two, well, those organ, the same organisation, but in two incarnations, which enabled us to establish and begin to develop our reminiscence sessions. Now, key to this, obviously, by implication, is the fact that partnership and collaboration is of huge importance. 
to this. We realised that we couldn't do it on our own and that participation and collaboration was at all levels, which Chris will talk to you about in a moment. Volunteer participation was hugely important as well. Getting volunteers, empowering volunteers and upskilling volunteers so that they were able to perhaps even create their own reminiscence sessions. So to create, if you like, um, a strong dissemination of, of the notion of reminiscence um, using cricket as a catalyst. And of course, we relied on a great deal of internal support from our colleagues within Yorkshire cricket. Yorkshire cricket consists very quickly of three elements. The Yorkshire Cricket Club, which governs what goes on on the field. The Yorkshire Cricket, uh, Yorkshire cricket Board, which looks at um, uh, recreational and club cricket. And uh, our own Yorkshire Cricket Foundation, which I've just mentioned. So before I hand over to Chris, um, who's obviously going to fill in the gaps there, um, one thing I would like to say is that Zoom, and I know there are challenges, technical challenges, but it's been a great way of reaching out to people. Our original plans were to deliver a range of in-situ reminiscence sessions at care homes. Hugh Dan mentioned the challenges around this earlier. And in schools and in uh, community and day centres and even in local cricket clubs. Well, unfortunately, COVID put paid to that for the moment. So we've delivered many of our sessions remotely on Zoom. We had to develop a new model, and Chris was very instrumental in delivering that. And it, it is important to mention that it is our absolute intention to return to the analogue form of delivery at some stage in the future, and that's getting into care homes, cricket clubs, um, community and day centres to deliver a growing and burgeoning programme of reminiscence sessions. So that's enough from me in terms of giving you uh, a kind of uh, an understanding of why we undertook this and why we started, and also a bit of a framework. And I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Chris, who was the project manager for our original reminiscence sessions and who was working at the coalface on this concept. All right, thanks, Paul, for that introduction. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, as Paul said, uh, we had a lot of challenges uh, with this project in the pandemic or coming into the pandemic and how we how we were intended to reshape it. Now, the reminiscent sessions, uh, memory sessions, were just one element of a, a larger project, as Paul stated. Uh, but it, as it turned out in the pandemic that this became the key element and probably the most successful even though we weren't able to meet each other as Paul said in the analog format the um, the online format whilst not as good as the face-to-face -face analog format for interaction uh, it's, it's really useful and helpful and it fills your morning or your afternoon or whenever the session is because if I look outside now in, in the office in the home office it's a bit of a gloomy day um, and what more, what better thing to do really than um, uh, share memories online and pictures of, of summer days at cricket clubs. So it, it's really something that I'd, um, I'd endorse anyone to have a go at, whether it be cricket, football, rugby, whatever your sport is. And as Paul said, it doesn't need to cost a lot of money. Um, this was part of a wider program, but if it was set up in in isolation or as a standalone item it, it doesn't need to cost any money or, or not much anyway so when we started the project we look to learn from the existing market so there's, there's various um reminiscence providers uh memories clubs some national organizations some regional but our, our model focuses on a bit of a learning from others and, and do it yourself so I noticed there's um, Tottenham Hotspur Foundation are in our virtual room today. If it's not something you're you're doing, it's something I'd um, I'd really endorse. And almost, as I mentioned on here, it's like a, a hub and spoke model. So the Yorkshire Cricket Foundation is a hub. It could be Tottenham Hotspur Foundation in football, and really working. It's all about working with your communities, your volunteers, your fan base. Uh, people living with dementia, people in care homes, as Paul mentioned, and encouraging them to to meet either virtually or online and just just talk about their memories. Um, what we found from our research, 
certainly in the online market and, and what works well is that 12 people on a Zoom call like this, Zoom chat, is probably the higher optimum level, the amount of people you'd want so that they all get an opportunity to chat and engage. Because if you start getting any more than 12, it becomes a bit like this, a, a seminar, a, um, a presentation rather than a, a group discussion. So that quickly, we quickly became, uh, familiar that, that was a, the an optimum number. And if you read the, the guide that Hugh's done with his colleague, Michael, um, Michael White, that even one-to-one -one is a good reminis reminiscent session or two-to-one is probably even more valuable. Uh, but the, the higher end is probably 12 in, a, in an online format. So with, with the success of this program, the, the Yorkshire Cricket Foundation set up two weekly sessions. So one on a morning, if, if you focus better on a morning, you can come to our Tuesday morning session. Or if you focus better on a, in an afternoon, you can come to a Thursday afternoon session. Or if you really enjoy it, you can, you can come along to both. And the benefit of it being online, we had some colleagues or people that you might know actually from the, the Shinty Memories Network log into our Cricket Memories because they, they love and enjoy cricket as well. So it's really, really powerful to engage people all over the country. So I've said here a hub and spoke approach. So we set up, the Yorkshire Cricket Foundation set up these sessions, but then we tried, or we tried to foster relationships with the cricket clubs in the area for them to do establish more local groups. And we, we were successful. There was one really good volunteer uh, Jai from Skipton, a uh, town in, in North Yorkshire. He set up a, a session and, and did a, a Friday morning session. So, um, and that was with no funding really, just with some limited support from myself. It's really only the cost of the Zoom package, but even then, if it's still free, you can do a 40 minute session for, for free and, and do a, a short and snappy approach with reminiscence. So, there's lots of opportunities there. And as Paul said, uh, I think the opportunity is looking at hybrid models so that people can engage online and in person uh, coming out of the pandemic. Although touch wood, we're hopefully not going to go back into it with, uh, with cases, cases rising. And then identification of um, participants is um, really important, obviously, to, um, to make sure you're having a, an impact. Now, initially in the pandemic, it was you, people in the local cricketing community that engaged all the people. Um, but we'd really like to move this model when we can get to meet people more in person in care homes and, and get into those care homes. So a lot of the volunteers who engage with the sessions are really keen to support the foundation in that approach as well. So it's a highly sustainable model. And I'd say the training, it, you know, it does, you can pick up training opportunities from other providers and um, mix and match. But I'd always go back to the, um, the Bible that, that Hughes developed, which is a very good um, resource to pick up if you're not, not familiar with, with reminiscence before. So just on the weekly sessions then, uh, there's a few pictures which I've tried to um, encapsulate some of the discussions that we um, we had over more than a year when I was running the sessions. So you've got Drax Power Station on the bottom right, um, or Drax Cricket Club with the, um, the power station in the background. And that, that picture in itself would stimulate all sorts of memories from the group about when they played there and how many people they got out, how many runs they scored. Um, if, in fact, there was a chap who um, submitted images every week to the group. So it was a, a guest, a local cricket club competition. So we had a, a Tony set of six. So it provides six every week and then we could, um, the, the group could guess a cricket club and that would all stimulate different memories of when they might have played there. And then when we went into the inclement weather period, we've got um, top right, I think it's New Rover in the snow. Um, Mel, one of our great volunteers, tells us all sorts of stories about New Rover. Um, we, we, sessions can go on for two to three hours if we wanted to. 
Um, and then there's CB Fry. Some historians uh, in the in this session might know more about CB Fry than uh, myself, but isn't that guy at cricket and all sorts of other sports? I understand a bit of a legend of his his time. So we um, we had a few sessions talking about CB Fry. And one thing I think Hugh's picked up in his research and what's been valuable to us is um, people that attend these sessions, some of them are, they're not maybe professional archivists um, in that sense, but they are on a voluntary basis, the, the sporting archivists, and they can help drive a lot of the discussions and the content. So although I myself and Paul might set up the Zoom links and it, let people into these sessions, it's very much driven by the volunteer facilitators and the content is, or the loose agenda, if you like, is, uh, is determined by the participants rather than the, the organisers, which I think is a great approach. And then the, the top picture in the, I think is one of our volunteers, Nick Briggs with Martin Moxon, one of the Yorkshire legends. Uh, so it just gives you a bit of a flavour of what we discuss in our um, online virtual weekly sessions and then I had a bit of an idea when we're in the pandemic so how can we supplement this program so we had our regular twice weekly sessions but how could we attract more people in it uh, into it a more um, diverse community both age and, and diversity and then I thought well why don't we do some special reminiscence events and um, didn't do any research as such, but um, thought maybe six o'clock's a good a good time to do it on a on a weekday, so that if people are still working during the pandemic, it can in, you can engage people who are still working, and that that six till seven slot also fits well if you like watching your soaps on an evening. You can still um, still engage with this session before you get into watching anything on an evening. So that was the the loose. Um, school of thought um, so I promoted several special events via Eventbrite people could register for free then they'd be sent a, a zoom link and one of them was um, Yorkshire cricket and its links to, to Scotland Scottish cricket so there's John Blaine in the middle and he, he had a bit of a career at Yorkshire and uh, Scotland International uh, Jim Love is pictured at the front of this team picture, bottom left on the right at the front. Um, so both of those two chaps were kind enough to give up the time and do a session with us talking about links with Yorkshire and, and Scottish cricket. And the people who engage with that from across Scotland, Yorkshire and possibly other places. In fact, George Salmon, who cricketers in the audience might know uh, Scotland player. I think he's on the left at the front. He saw this advertised on Twitter and just engaged in the session as a participant. So that was the kind of length and breadth of people we were, we were attracting. We also did one on um, women's cricket and not just the, the growth of the game, which is huge exponential growth in not just women's cricket, but other other women's sport, rugby being uh, key as well. Uh, so we had Cecilia, who, who played for the Yorkshire Diamonds, but she also worked for the, the county club. And a lineup of um, of other ladies who both played cricket and worked in cricket. So there was a discussion all around working and playing in cricket, which was, was quite interesting. Tony Collins came to, to one session, maybe known to historians in the room, more as a as a rugby historian, but he is um, is a historian of all kind of ball sports really, and does have a bit of a background in cricket. So he gave us a flavour on his experience of researching and and supporting cricket. Um, and we also did a session with um, cross regional session with our colleagues in Nottinghamshire County Cricket Club, uh, where we talked about players and officials who have links between the two counties. Mark Arthur probably being one, um, the head chap at Yorkshire Cricket currently, uh, also obviously been in a similar position at um, Nottinghamshire County Cricket Club and 
working in other sports as well. So he's worked in, um, in football at, at Notts Forest. Um, so reminiscence, although we're coming at it from the angle of sporting reminiscence and very much cricket, it can also um, disperse in conversation going to other sports or what people um, did when they were at the cricket, who they went there with, um, what the snacks they took with them and things like that. And my background or my sport is really rugby league, but the, the link between cricket and rugby league, there's a huge amount of people that support both sports. Um, it's really interesting that the things that can come out. So just to finish with um, really where, where we think this can go in the future, uh, more monthly special events, cross-regional. Uh, it could be, if in an online format, it could be cross-continent, international, global, really, in terms of the mix of people that engage uh, in this, this online solution. So there's scope to do more of that across the cricketing community and, and work with other cricketing sporting foundations to do so. Um, a solution for care homes, I mean, we can soon start going in there and we need to increase our volunteer base to do that, but that's something the foundation would really like to do. Uh, and the emerging social prescribing network, uh, key con the social prescribers are a key contact for me in terms of um, promoting the, the sort of strength of this offer really um, and they'll they'll promote it out to their networks and doctor surgeries and everything so it's good to know who your local social prescribers are and the, the way I see it growing as I said then Skipton Memory set up as a bit of a, a satellite um, group to us uh, there's also scope within the Yorkshire region I've talked about setting up a, a maybe a Bradford group, be it online or in person, but also still coming back to the, the Yorkshire Cricket Foundation as the, the professional organisation for support, advice and guidance, really. But it, it can all operate if you can have a free facility and someone's willing to buy some tea, coffee and biscuits. Uh, it doesn't need to be any real cost to the, this activity other than volunteers' time to coordinate and facilitate. Uh, and it's quite an inspiring thing to do if you enjoy talking about sport, but also um, you're happy to listen to others because you, you've got to allow people to, to share and um, give everyone an opportunity, really. Uh, so it's all about inspiring volunteers, but for me, it's, um, it's not really a hard sell. Um, so that's all. Any any, any questions? Thank, thanks for listening. And um, this is a picture I always like to share when um, when talking about cricket and reminiscence. And um, this is a Boxing Day game they have at North Leeds Cricket Club. And um, this particular day, I think it was probably two thousand and eight. I'm told it was snowbound, but they they still had a crack at it, and they all looked to be um, enjoying themselves. So thanks for listening, and I hope that was uh, that was useful. Oh, well, uh, thank you both very much uh, for that. That was um, fascinating. And uh, really, I mean, we look at that in um, conjunction with what Sheila was saying, it just shows you the vast resources and the different type of resources, but the driving force an organization like your foundation can have. It, it kind of leads us seamlessly onto our final presentation, which I hope I can control from this end uh, for Christine. But um, I notice, incidentally, and this is something we may, if we had time, talk about at the end, we're moving, all of us moving between the, the voc vocabulary we use is always interesting, and we're moving between the use of memories and reminiscence. And there are some challenges there for us all in terms of how we present what we're doing, whether, you know, just labeling them as memories or reminiscence. I think yeah. there's a a confusion being created here that we need to maybe address and sort out. What are we talking about? Are they people's memories or are they reminiscences about, you know, it's a nuanced thing that I think we have to deal with at some point. But anyway, that will park that just now as, as an issue. Uh, but I, one of my fondest memories of, of early this year and, and getting out of COVID was to get to visit for the first time ever and to play on, on the, um, the Lynx course that is um, Royal Dornoch Golf Club 
in the north of Scotland, and I was very lucky, very fortunate there to be invited to play with their great captain. I think he's still captain, Christine Willie Mackay, or has he given up and moved on? I know he's officially <laughs> captain now. <laughs> he's still he's still captain Willie. Uh, anyway, he he uh, treated my wife and I to a fantastic game of golf on Royal Dornoch's links, and uh, I don't want to start any wars about this, but Royal Dornoch Golf Club was uh, nominated by the World Golf Awards in 2020 as Scotland's best course. I merely state that as a fact. I'm, <laughs> I'm standing well back when that argument begins to rage uh, all over the golf courses of Scotland. But certainly the day I played it, it was well worthy of its uh, title as Scotland's best golf course. I didn't do it justice, uh, but it was, uh, and I think it's actually one of the best golf courses in the world. But they have now uh, developed a lot of the work they're doing and they have uh, opened up a remarkable link with um, the University of the Highlands and Islands, which has great potential in terms of developing some of their work. And they're also becoming uh, more involved, hopefully, with the work that we do in reminiscence or memories uh, relating to golf. So I'm going now, hopefully, to share uh, the screen for Christine Callingham, who's going to take us through some of the work that's being done uh, in the Royal Dornoch Golf Club. So if you give me just a second, I'll try and bring that up. Um, here we go. Ah, good. Okay. If you can just talk me through that, Christine, as you need the slides. So I'm one of two amateur archivists at Royal Golf Club. And today I want to uh, focus on the challenges of exhibiting the past and the present and hopefully the future with an emphasis on the relationship between the archive and the club's individual and collective memories. Um, so I use the term archive quite broadly to uh, not only include documents, but um, objects and images and recordings and so on. So um, a brief history, which um, Hugh has touched on, um, it's Dornick's a small borough in the, on the east coast of Sutherland, an hour's drive north of Inverness, and it has a permanent population of about two and a half thousand, which spells considerably in the summer. Um, golf is known to have been played on the links uh, since 1616. And so if we now fast forward 260 years, in 1877, local citizens formed the Sutherland Golfing Society and constructed two traditional links courses. Um, moving forward in 1883, it was a pivotal moment in the history of the club um, when John Sutherland, uh, who was pretty amazing, had the vision, he was so young, he was only 19, had the vision and ambition to create what is now a world-renowned club. Um, John was club secretary for over 50 years, but uh, also he was town councillor, um, which as we go through the presentation, um, uh, proved to be a very good move. Um, and uh, he was extremely well connected. Uh, he wrote for the Daily News, which was a big broadsheet um, for, uh, between 1906 and 1912. So Dornick Golf Club's burgeoning reputation uh, was fueled by the press connection and it generated significant publicity. And it was no surprise that London-centric aristocrats and a newspaper baron, a prime minister, society painters, suffragettes headed for Dornick. Um, the greatest golfers of their time, Harry Varden, James Braden, J.H. Taylor traveled, giving exhibition matches, um, obviously contributing massively to, the, uh, to raising the club's profile. And the club has become so prominent that it has remained a top destination for keen golfers worldwide ever since. And it uh, repeatedly features, as Hugh touched upon, um, as being in the world's top golf courses, uh, Scotland, UK, and in the world, we're usually in the top 10. So um, regularly hosting a number of national and international tournaments. So many of the locals, spanning several generations have been and are still closely associated with the club. And it's quite evident that club and community are closely related. Um, the club indeed is a key contributor to the local economy 
making substantial contributions to the community fund, which helps support a number of local organisations, including other sports. Um, if we could have a slide two. That one, that's it. Um, so since 1877, unsurprisingly, the club has amassed a large number of historic records and objects, um, memories really, which have been randomly dispersed in and around the clubhouse, either on display or in storage since 1909, when the current clubhouse was opened. And, we, and on this image here, this is the opening, official opening. And you can see John Sutherland. I don't know if my cursor will at. We think that's John Sutherland um, and Andrew Carnegie is in there somewhere. That looks like Captain Ryle. And you can see you've got a mixture here of men and women on that special day. So um, five years ago, how I came to be here even, um, five years ago, the general manager, um, Neil Hampton, who is a keen golf historian, launched a project to formally assess the club's historical items and create an archive. So my colleague Eileen and myself, we're not trained archivists. So it was a big challenge, sort of fortified by our combined skill set of teaching, administration, secretarial expertise, art history, and an ability to play golf, which was very useful, and a keen knowledge of history, which between us accrued over, to be over several decades. We connected with Golf Links, Dornick's local museum, which has several exhibitions in there, permanent exhibitions related to the club and also stores our um, quite extensive photograph uh, image library. Um, uh, we looked at other golf clubs such as Nairn, I think I saw that in a previous slide. Um, we visited a number of us established archives in Venice, um, the Nucleus Archive in Wick, which is amazing, and Time Span in Helmsdale. We met many experts who were very generous with their knowledge in time. One of the key things that we installed was AdLib, which is design, it's a um, museum software uh, designed to support Spectrum, which is the UK-wide documentation standard for museums. And we hope that that has ensured succession to future proof and secure the heritage of the club. Because everything is archived, it, it's accessioned onto AdLib. And so we, we should know at any point in time where anything is, sort of a one-stop shop, really. Um, it goes without saying that archives and memory are inextricably linked. Archives have have been defined as a rich complexity and repository of memories. And archivists play an important role in directing organizations to what they should archive, mindful of what they should remember and what they want to be remembered for. So they are valuable resources which serve, as we've discussed as well, um, as served as catalyst for the retrieval of memories and to serve and enhance and deepen the individual and the club's collective memory. So if we could have slide three. Ah, oh, there we are. Um, the key objectives are to make the club's collections more accessible, more visible, more stimulating, more educational, and to further engage members, visitors, and the local community, and ultimately to enrich the experience of playing at Royal Dornick. And here we see the Carnegie Shield, and there's a strong, obviously, connection there between Angry Carnegie and Skibo Castles just across the water. And it's the most impressive feature of the display in the clubhouse. It's the Carnegie Shield is still played for annually. So it forms a permanent exhibition, but in the clubhouse, which was internally is still essentially the 1909 clubhouse is rooted in a distant past compared to today where the so-called great and the good, the Andrew Carnegie's and the John Sutherland's have been memorialized. 
The winners are symbolized in banks of silver cups and trophies and medals and imposing honors boards. Um, Hugh, if we could have slides four and five. Yeah. All right, okay. So um, portraits of the forefathers hang in the house, photographs of influential famous players from past generations, names that will resonate with some people, but probably not most members are on the walls in the 19th. So looking back into the past, Memory then becomes, as it's so removed from today, well, it's, you know, 120 odd years later, um, memory ceases to be relevant and, and makes way really for a more traditional look in the clubhouse. Also, we've then got to question, you know, real, you know, is it real? Is it true? We can't really verify that. So that creates challenges for the archivist. In this picture here, we've got John Sutherland seated at the front. That's, that's Walt, uh, Walter Matheson there. Um, and this is the Northern Counties Cup. Um, so yes, which uh, all those individuals there each have their own memories, but I won't go into that. Um, so, since gaining a full understanding of the archive, we have now enabled a greater degree of access through practical engagement with membership and the local community. The archive is more established and better known um, by members who consider it a resource to augment and illustrate special events. We provide the resources and we usually lead the talks. Um, a number of exhibitions, big and small, involving members and community have been curated with the objective of providing context, visual stimulus, education and engagement. And the next two slides, please, that's seven and eight. So that you'll see um, were done by school children and this year's of Dornick. The year-long festival was one of the biggest collaborations between the town, the golf club, the UK and royal clubs. People travelled from the royal clubs all over the world and descended on Dornoch for a week-long uh, tournament and um, dinners, etc. Um, ceremonial gifts, photographs, paintings, audio recordings, memorabilia and golf-related murals as these um, now form the permanent mission. And um, also Neil and a few others planted a community time capsule, which contained a number of items, including newspapers, a mobile phone and a charger, just in case, a bottle of whiskey, golf, golf balls, club newsletters and a CD flash drive. It is to be dug up on the 1st of January 2117. So that's a good time to be an archivist at Royal Dornick. Um, modern technology, um, which we're sort of dipping our toes into in the um, um, has enabled an explosion in oral and visually recorded or visual recorded histories. The club has a dynamic and ever-changing website and use of social media chronicles a, a running commentary on most aspects of club life. Um, several recordings, particularly the ones in 2016, feature older club members in conversation reminiscing about the club and their earlier playing days and have been uploaded to YouTube. And if we could have the next few slides, please, Hugh. So, in contrast to the formal wooden boards downstairs in the lobby, um, Eileen and I um, decided to highlight the championships that have been played at Royal Dornick in this much more sort of striking visual form. Um, and the championships only start in 1935, which um, I wondered why, given its high profile high profile and this was because John Sutherland thought there were too many tournaments going on and we wouldn't have them there really <laughs> so so that's when he gave up uh, he retired from 
from the club in 1933, so the, hence the 1935. So we've got the background of the club, and then we've got this timeline, sort of highlighting the the exhibitions and and um, where possible we sourced uh, photographs. And this is an interesting article on the long and winding road to Dornick by Derek Lawrenson, who penned a very, very funny um, piece about the RNA selecting Royal Dornick to host the 1985 Amateur Championship, which is, uh, uh, along with the US Amateur Championship, the two most prestigious amateur championships in the world. And there was a very generous and equally amusing um, letter to Derek um, from the club captain. So these boards are visually striking. Um, they sit in the main lounge and they commemorate the competitions, as I said. Um, so the names and faces are set against the dramatic landscape. And it, these boards have proved to be exceptionally popular um, because of, I think, the wow factor, there have been sort of instant react, favor, uh, reactions and memories, particularly for golfers who took part in the tournaments or were present as spectators. And revisiting Dornick, you know, this certainly prompts a lot of discussion. Um, the wooden honours boards still have their place and they're downstairs. They've got the same information, but obviously without all the visuals, um, but still serve to commemorate the older sort of formality and tradition of the club. This board is the clubhouse and course, which we put together. We were going through photographs and, and uh, we thought that this would be the, um, the board that's on the landing and the back staircase. So it's, it's got a natural platform there to sort of stop and reflect. <laughs> and so it's, it's in a sort of um, time sequence. So we look at the very, very early clubhouse, the, more, the um, 1909 arts and craft course, and then various aspects of the course. Um, here we have a lady um, she's actually mowing one of the greens and, um, whoops, uh, what's happening here? I don't know, it's got a mind of its own, I'm afraid. Uh, that's okay. Uh, so if you're ever at Royal Dornick, you know, um, you have a look at that and you'll get a, a very good history of the club. Um, the, door, the next slide along, yes, this is quite interesting because the Dornick has had a very strong connection with the United States. I mean, there's the Carnegie connection, but there's also the connection which came about through a lot of talented players um, going to the United States um, in the early 20th century, um, quite enterprising. They left small Dornick and off to, off to the States to pursue distinguished careers, particularly in course design with obviously Donald Ross, but his brother Alex won the US Open. So there's still this strong connection to this day. And we, you know, we, many, many clubs come over here from the States annually, regular visitors as do players and um, people from Dornick in America, uh, sorry, Brits, head over to the States. So that's that's quite a nice, the ties are very strong to this day, really. Um, uh, moving on, um, for the past few years, um, Dornick's been engaged in a number of sessions with the Dornick Golf Memories Group and the Dornick Carers Group. And Eileen and I were um, very pleased to help with the inaugural visit. Um, and the, the, the club has teamed up with Alzheimer's Scotland and have heard, well, prior to the pandemic, of course, were hosting monthly get togethers where members of the club and community with dementia enjoy, come to the club, have coffee and with aids, photographic aids and equipment, uh, relive golfing memories supported by staff and the archive department. And another initiative, um, which we've had two sessions now, is the Life Members Annual Lunch, um, which also gives older members the opportunity to reunite with their peers and to share memories. Um, we've had two events, both hosted, well, the presentations have been presented by Eileen and myself from the archive department. So moving swiftly on to the future, <laughs> the 
the golf club well essentially it's i think it's in a, a transition phase a new clubhouse has been mandated and designed and will replace the 1909 building um, unlike the existing clubhouse the new new clubhouse is radically different um, it's not that 1909 sort of southern arts and crafts style it is it's, it reflects more the traditional highland architecture with generous window views to connect the course the coastline and the town so we've been fortunate as archivists to work with the architects to design an archive storage facility and to contribute to the placement of bespoke exhibition spaces so from the entrance, the members and visitors will experience key object and objects and images as they move up through an exhibition staircase, which will feature carefully placed objects uh, to support a joined up historical narrative. The stairs on the stair, uh, the levels on the staircase will also encourage, you know, time to stop and look and contemplate and other areas will facilitate and promote clo closer examination of documents and small items like medals. But it also, this development sort of off offers the opportunity or offered us the opportunity to appraise the present historical narrative and potentially create a more egalitarian representation of a modern forward-looking sporting organization. Anchors, anchored by the foundations and traditions of the past, but with an acknowledgement that the club represents and celebrates not only the sporting experience of champions, but also those of the regular golfer. So finally, being able to speak at this year's conference has been a special opportunity to more fully understand and reflect on the club and archive and where it's come from and where it's going. So golf, started 400 years ago, the club started 150 years ago, and the club really is between that traditional past and the modern future. So we'll have to make a number of decisions as we transition into the new clubhouse, what we will remember and commemorate and how we will incorporate the past. We've, one thing we do know is that the club's history is also the community's history. It is the town's main, social, sporting and economic asset that has a unique history and a magnificent course, which is justifiably acclaimed. So it's a responsibility and an obligation that the heritage of this club is sustained, protected and celebrated for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that, Christine. Uh, it really was a fantastic whip through the, the whole history and the, the scale of the developments you're planning. And I'm sorry for the technical difficulties at the, at the start there again, but uh, it really is a, a very special place. The whole Dornoch area is, is a fantastically uh, attractive place in so many ways. It's architecture, it's environment, and particularly it's rich golfing heritage. And I was very pleased to see a couple of shinty balls in the, in the display there as well, tucked <laughs> away in the corner. Uh, and please, please pass on my best wishes uh, to um, Willie Mackay and all the other uh, guys who are doing such a good job with you. And um, for what it's worth, tell them I, I think they should uh, support their archivists in everything they're doing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, will, I will. Right, we, we've run over a bit uh, time, just a bit because of the technical issues we had. So I think, given that it's one o'clock, I do want to encroach too much on on people's lunchtime uh, period. So we, we'll capture questions and so on from the chat, um, and and I do think it it would be worth uh, tossing this issue about memories and re reminiscence around at some point. Uh, there'll be various points today and tomorrow when we can discuss it. So can I thank you all for your patience and your perseverance with the technology and everything else. Thank you for your contributions. The uh, next session will be led by Justine Riley, our Chief Executive at 1.45, and that promises to be quite interesting, quite relevant to what we've been talking about um, in the previous this session, just finishing. So that's Sporting Heritage in the Nations. Uh, and I think it'd be well worth um, joining that at 1.45, which is 45 minutes away. So gives us time, hopefully, to get the technical issues sorted out and to have a bite of lunch. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. And we'll see you again at 1.45.